Uh, if we can't raise our hand in honor of the Word of God and for God Himself, I don't know what we can raise our hand for. We can go to a football game and we can yell and scream for two hours for a bunch of guys to run up and down the field, but we can't make a peep for the Lord. And uh, that's a shame. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. Please take your copy of God's Word and open it up to the book of Genesis, chapter 26, as we continue our uh, leapfrog crawl through. We're leaping over chapters and we're crawling through certain passages for a purpose to honor our Lord, but to see what He has to say. The chapter of 26 of Genesis in all of the Word of God is the only chapter that's designated only for Isaac. Isaac lived longer than the other great three patriarchs. The other two, I should say, he's one of the great three. and uh, But he has little, really, in relation to the others said about him. There's not a lot said. He lived the longest and we got less about him. And there is a principle of Christ in that. His ministry was three years, and we don't have a whole lot about him considering he's eternal. But he was the chosen son, just as Isaac was chosen to be the son, to be the seed that Jesus would come through, the great Messiah. And we're thankful for that. But as we open up chapter 26, I'm going to ask you to stand in honor of reading God's Word. We're going to read a few verses and then pray. Verse 1, And there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went into Amalek, king of the Philistines, to Gerar. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries. And I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham, thy father. Let's pray. Father, as we look at your word that is alive, that is eternal, we look at the word of God of Christ, the word that became flesh. We pray that, Father, you would merge the Old Testament, the New Testament, and where we are right now in a very special way. That we would make a choice today of how we will walk, how we will wander. Bless this time for your glory. May your word come alive. And may it speak to us as individuals. And may it speak to us collectively as we worship you. In your precious name we do pray. Amen. You may be seated. So in this great word, uh, we see the wandering of Isaac. <laughs> Isaac has a great legacy. We're talking about grandparents. You may be here today and you may see your Christian walk, your coming to Christ, and you may point to a great person, a great grandmother, a, a grandfather, whatever the case may be. You may point to that person and uh, you may grow, draw great strength from that example. And as parents, as mentors, whatever the case may be, we need to be careful how we lead. There's an old story where there was a young man going hunting with his father and they were in the mountains and it was treacherous, very dangerous at every step. And the little boy cried out in some fear. He had the back of his dad's pants in his belt. He said, Daddy, be careful where you step because I'm right behind you. Boy, what a wake up call. Amen. Be careful where we step. Because today's message is going to remind us, first of all, of amazing grace. It's going to remind us of the promises of God in which we can stand. And it's going to remind us of where we were saved from. We're either standing on those promises on the rock or we're on quicksand. No other choice. The world says that's too restrictive. That's too rigid. That's not fair. It's not... Possible, but it is true. We either stand in Canaan on the promises or we are in Egypt or on our way to Egypt and we're in quicksand. And uh, we need a wake-up call. We re really have a choice and we'll end with this. So I'm going to tell you where we're headed. It's nice to know we're going to Florida, right? If we're going, let's, let's tell where we're going. And we're going to a place where we have to search our hearts and ask the Holy Spirit to put His precious finger on that spot where we make a decision either to follow in the stumbling, unstable footsteps of our father of the flesh 
or to truly walk in the ways and the promises that are providential of a holy God. And that this passage 26, a lot of people skip over it, but uh, it's a great passage as all of God's word is. And I, uh, I look at these the, the, the temptations that he faces in uh, verse one. There's a famine. And Brother Barry, it's a famine in the promised land. And there are people today that look at the, fa the famine, they look at the circumstance, and they say, well, what happened to the faithfulness of God? I had a promise in His Word in vacation Bible school when I was 12. I got saved, and somebody told me I could trust Him. They told me He would never forsake me. He would always be one that was closer than a brother. He would always be a rock that I could stand on. That he would always be that ship I could get in when the storm got too rough. He would be a refuge, a city that I could run to. He would be eternally faithful. He would love me with a perfect love. Then why in the world is there a famine when I'm being obedient where he put me? Why in the world was there a time at Woodlawn Baptist Church when there was a spiritual famine? A spiritual famine in your home, in your workplace, in your ministry. God's truly called me. He moved in the power of His Holy Spirit. He put me on this path. I've got a great legacy. I've got a promise. There's some that say that Isaac was the son of a great man and the father of a great son. There's a message for us there too. God calls us all to be great in Christ, not in self. But He's in the promised land and His temptation is... If God has me in the promised land and there's now a famine, I've got to act because God is not. God has forsaken me. He's fallen asleep. Maybe He's not real. Maybe He's not interested. Maybe I was never truly saved. Maybe the Holy Spirit just didn't work it in my life. Maybe He's punishing my body because of some great sin. And Christ said in one example in the New Testament, this man is not this way because of his mom and daddy's sin or his own, but that I might be glorified. That God might be exalted. And we're in the book of James and we're in the book of John on Wednesdays and Sunday nights and we're talking about trials and tribulations. And we're looking at how God uses that as a great badge of honor for His glory. That He can trust you with a great burden. He can trust you with a great temptation. And we lose that because we have this accuser of the brethren who's always telling us a lie. He's the father of lies. And he gets evidently into the mind and the flesh and the emotion of Isaac. So he does what a lot of us do. He says, if I'm in the promised land and there's a famine, God knows that I have needs and they're real needs. And I must act in myself and help God out because he evidently made a mistake or either I didn't hear him clearly, but there's a problem because a great God would not bring me to the promised land and let me starve. You got to remember who this Isaac is. He, he's no uh, poor man. He inherited the wealth of Abraham. Don't lose that sight. So he has a lot of pressure, Brother Eddie. He has a lot of pressure of this legacy that I'm not going to be the guy who goes down in history of blowing it all. I am not ending my life of being Isaac who ruined the wealth of, of Father Abraham because God may need that money in order to, to fulfill His promise that the Messiah will come through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob's seed. You ever try to help God out? Yes. I mean, He's a patient God and, and He looks at us and He says, you know, I really don't need your help. I, I really don't need your advice. What I need you to do is listen to, to, to seek me and to obey. So Isaac is living in the land of obedience. It's, some say it's symbolic of heaven. I will say that is a stretch. I believe it does uh, resemble some things as promise. But when I study Canaan, I don't see a lot of heaven in it. I see a lot of problems. And there's no problems in heaven. There's no death in heaven. But we'll, get, we'll let the commentaries get away with that and we'll say it is some sense of the promised land. But his weakness was in verse 1 that he turns toward the land of Egypt. And we know because we've studied it that Egypt is symbolic of the world. And today when you and I talk about Egypt, 
It talks about the things of the culture, the promises, the chariots, the strength, the army, the riches of Egypt, which is all the things the world says. If you will just come down to Egypt, you'll be content. You'll be blessed. You'll be protected. Go get a good job in Egypt. Get a good 401k. Settle into your retirement plan and just work hard out. And at the end of that rainbow, you're going to be the most content, blessed person on planet Earth because you plugged in to a great system. God's saying, I didn't call you to be part of Egypt. Matter of fact, I saved you from Egypt. I walked you out in a miraculous way with all the riches of, of Egypt. Right? I mean, that's what he's telling us today. I've walked you out, Miss Bernice. Personally, I led you out and I was your, your light. I was your guide. I was your God and I did the impossible. He walked us out of hell itself when he saved us. That's a miracle. But oh, Isaac, he gets weak. He looks at his circumstances. He starts to see his bank account dipping a little bit. Things are not going well. You can't farm. It's not a great harvest. And rather than seeking the counsel of God, rather than going to God and His Word and His promises, standing on the promise that was given through Abraham because of his obedience, that Isaac inherited not only the riches, but the spiritual promises, he seeks man's help in Egypt. But you notice he's not going to Egypt necessarily. He's going toward Egypt. Don't miss that. There's a reason that's there. There's a reason he's going in that direction. Because the devil just wooed him a little bit. He's just baiting him a little bit. On Sunday night we went through an analogy and a word called drawn away. That we're drawn away by the lust of our flesh. That's why we sin. It's, nothing, it's an inside job. And we talked about the ability of the devil to be a masterful fisherman. And what he does is he gets us looking at the bait. And it looks real. It looks alive. It's an imitation of something that's good. And what happens is we don't look for the hook. We look for the bait. And at just the right time when we've been drawn away... He sets the hook. And then it is a fight for your life. Amen? Amen. Am I the only one that's been hooked? <laughs> okay. So people like Barry and Gary and Arliss, who are masterful fishermen, they know how to trick fish. And they reap the benefit of that. And the devil knows how to trick me and you. And he knew what the weakness of Isaac was. And he moved in that. And he turned him not with a destination necessarily stated, but it's in the heart of Isaac. Why else would God say, don't go there? Because God can see our heart. On his map, he may have just said, I'm going partially there. I'm going to stop off at this little place. I'm not going all the way to Egypt. But you and I both know that we are drawn away by the lust of our flesh. And sin will take us further than we want to go. Keep us longer than we wanted to stay. And cost us a whole lot more than we planned to pay. And Isaac is headed for destruction. And a bad God, an evil God, a hateful God would say, So what? Just let him go down there and get his spanking. Let him go down there and be the prodigal son. And when he finds himself face down in the slop of this world of Egypt, then by my grace, I'll get him. He'll come to himself. He'll come back home and then I'll bless him. But our great God doesn't do that. He intervenes in verse 2. He says, do not go down to Egypt. He's very specific. He knows his heart. And then he commands Isaac. You go where I tell you to go. Now, this is the first error, if you will, in this passage where the heart of Isaac says, I'm going to Egypt. I'm forsaking my God because evidently He's forsaken me and it's all fair, right? I mean, if God forsakes me, then I don't have any obligation to hang around and suffer in famine. I'm going to act because God is evidently falling asleep or He needs my help. But on his way, as his heart starts to turn, and he starts to move his motive and his, his mansion down to Egypt, if you were in that direction, God just intervenes by grace. He says, no, oh boy, there's a better way for you, and it's not found in Egypt, but I have a way that I'm going to tell you. And he says, and the Lord appeared unto him. And you and I have read the Word of God so much, we don't even get the magnitude of that. 
that there came a day in our time as Christians when the Lord God Himself appeared to us. We get so tied up. If Lord, if I could just see You. Lord, if You would just visit me and manifest Yourself in some wonderful work or miracle. And the Lord said, that's evil. If the Word of God isn't enough and the power of the Holy Spirit working in our heart is not enough, nothing will get it done. We have all had the Lord thy God come to us and appear to us in His Spirit, in His Word, and He speaks and He said, this is the Creator of all things who has every reason to cast out Isaac because he's fallen weak, he's walking away from the promises, and he's headed down to Egypt. And he knows the evil in Egypt because he just happens to have a testimony of a stumbling father who went down there and made a mess of things. Like father, like son. Let me just stop just a second. Because there is a lie out there that there is generational curses. There's a word in the Bible that says it'll follow you generation to generation, their sons and sons. Well, I got great news for you. When you become a new creature in Christ, all things become new, and you got a new start, and you have a choice. So if your father was a drunkard, don't ever tell God you've got to be a drunkard too. You may have that tendency because you saw it lived out. You may have the scars and the wounds, and you may be allured like all the rest of us in the flesh. But you will never stand before our great God who saved you, who redeemed you, who turned you into a new creature, who gave you His own holy life, and be able to say, well, I couldn't help it because I was born that way. Not true. That's a lie from the devil. We're going to call him out right now by name. He never calls himself the devil. He never proclaims himself. He never presents himself. He lurks in the background trying to deceive me and you to catch his own allure at just the right time. We're not going to allow Him to do that in our lives because we believe He's real. But we believe He, he failed. That, that we have victory in Christ. He's been conquered. He's a conquered foe. And God intervenes just like He did, did in our life. He says, don't go, but I'm going to lead you. Go not down into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Now dwell there means permanent. I want you to stay where I put you. I don't want you to linger out and go down to Egypt for vacation. You remember the story that we started here and the story of Ruth where Naomi and her family first went to visit, then they settled in, and then it was, what, 10 years later? That's what happens to us when we go to Egypt. Why can we not be content in the pasture of the promised land God has placed us in? But God says not only that, I'm not going to only tell you where not to go, I'm going to tell you where to dwell, but I'm going to show you that. Remember Abraham? He went going, not knowing. He went to a land that he knew not of. God knew it, but he had to step out in faith and journey. Then he says, sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee. If you, will, you will stay here temporarily. If you'll pass through, sojourn implies that he's a foreigner. Right now, you and I are pilgrims passing through. This is not our home. Amen? We're just passing through. It's temporary. Beverly, you've got a mansion. More importantly, you've got Jesus waiting on you. You're just passing through. This whole body is just a temporary place that your soul and spirit and heart lives for the glory of Jesus Christ. One day you're going to shed it like an old jacket and you're going home to glory. And hallelujah, uh, what a day. Amen. But right now, we're just sojourning. We're foreigners. That's why the people don't understand us. We're peculiar people. You speak a different language. It's called love and mercy and grace. And it's a perfect language. My first Sunday here, Sister Randy come up and said, I'm glad you're a crier. I am too. And she said something I shall never forget. Tears are a language. Amen. Tears are a language. They speak. And I tell you, I cry at this old place we're passing through sometimes, but I got the promise of glory that awaits. Amen. So uh, verse 3, it says, For unto thee and unto thy seed. He's implying Jesus Christ there, but also the whole generation of Christians. I will give all, not some, all 
these countries. Now, who has the authority to give a country, much less a group of countries, the greatest authority of all, God in heaven, Jehovah God, who says, you can talk about your government all you want to. In Daniel 2, 21, 22, he basically tells us, I will bring up leaders, I will bring up nations, I give wisdom, I give knowledge and understanding, because it dwelleth in him. And we have that promise, and he knows this is going to play out. I love, I love, love, love this fact. That on my way to rebellion, on my way to Egypt and sin, God by His grace intervenes and He doesn't shout at me. He doesn't whip me. He does not yell at me. He does not punish me. He reminds me of a covenant and a promise and a place. That's grace. See, we have this, this vision that God is mad and He is angry and He is walking around with His belt and He's whipping us every time we get out of shape. By God's grace, He looks through the blood of Jesus and He sees the person of Christ in each and every one of us and He desires to bless us. Hallelujah, amen. Somebody wake up. Pull a fire alarm. Then He says, the seeds of the nation. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven. And we got to stop right here and remember how many sons, how many blessed chosen sons Abraham had. Remember from last week? One. Two weeks ago. Ishmael was not, he was a, he was a child of the, the law. He was a child of disobedience. Just happened to pick him up in Egypt. Well, now we have the blessed son And he's going to have two sons, Jacob and Esau. We talked about them last week. The the wrestling in the womb. The struggle in the womb. And now he's saying something that's unthinkable. That you're one son and you have two. And I'm going to bless you and your seed. Your children are going to be as the stars. Only God and His authority and His eternal life and power can promise that. But in thy seed is pointing to the Messiah in which all nations would be blessed. Me and you today can thank Father Abraham that he was elected, chosen from a pagan country to be the father of faith. That he in in an impossible, miraculous way would have a son. At an old age, Sarah would give birth to, to, to the seed and that seed would follow. But ultimately at the pinnacle point would be Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And Why? I mean, Isaac's not, he's living in obedience, but he slips out the back door. Verse 5. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge and my commandments and my statutes and my laws. In everything, you see how Abraham is being brought to a place where it's being paralleled with thy seed, the Messiah. That Abraham is a token. He is given as a mortgage. His faith is counted as righteousness that points through the completion and fulfillment that Christ would make in His holy, perfect life and His sacrifice on Calvary so that you and I as His seed, as His children, can point back to Abraham and says, because of Abraham, because of Christ, It is counted as righteousness for my sake. And that's why the devil himself can't do a thing with the church of God. He's been trying since the very beginning. And every time he persecutes the church, it grows. Because he has really no say so in it. All he can do is cast the bait. And then we have to make a decision. Bite or reject. And you see... Uh, It's because of Abraham's obedience and his following. But verse 6, And Isaac dwelt in Gear. Partial obedience. You ever been there? I I, I kind of obeyed God, but what I did is I just kind of sidestepped it. I got one foot over here, one foot over there, and I'm just standing on that. But why is that overlooked? Why does God's grace intervene again? Because of people like Nana who has flowers down here who prayed in the past and obeyed God's word and listened to his voice and lived by his commandments and his law that God by his grace through Abraham 
through Nana, through Christ, can bless a family. Be careful how you live. Be careful how you walk. Be careful how you serve and worship. Because I promise you, I promise you, it matters. I've got a grandmother named Nail. Nail Prophet Ray. And I am convinced when she was married to my grandfather before she died, he was a Baptist preacher. I'm told she was the greatest woman in Possum Trot area when it came to her God. And when she would have a child, she would go out behind my grandfather's old place and she would strip the dirt down to the dirt on the ground. And she would lay down in that dirt on her face and pray for that baby. She died giving birth to my daddy. I never got to meet her. He never got to meet her. I'm convinced with all my heart that that little lady crawled down in that dirt one day when she was carrying my daddy. And she prayed for the baby that would take her life. And I'm standing in this pulpit because of it. I know it with all my heart. Can't wait to say thank you. Thank you. It matters. Prayer is more powerful than any nuclear war weapon. We won't even pick it up to fight the devil. And if I can't pick the power of prayer and the weapon of prayer up for my children, for my church, why would I mention my business and my bank account? Priority in prayer. It matters how you work. It matters how you walk. And it matters how you serve. Verse 7, And the men of this place asked him of his wife. And he said, She is my sister. Like father, like son. Abraham's and tried this lie. He tried this trick down in Egypt. By God's grace, he intervened. He would not let it happen. But I'm going to tell you, what a disgraceful situation. That the man chosen by God in a miraculous birth, who walked up on Moriah and was willing to lay down his life, willing to trust his father to take his own life, can't trust that God's going to feed him in the promised land. And when he gets down to where he's not supposed to be, he decides to lie. She is my sister, for he feared to say she is my wife. You ashamed of your wife? You fearful of that? I'm glad that Jesus isn't ashamed of me. That whatever I face, he never says, that is not my bride. That is not my child. He's adopted. I don't even know who the kid is. He just jumped in the car and here we are. And I tell you, he's a mess, but I'm going to just love him and I'm going to try to help him. Jesus just takes me up front. He carries me. He presents me. And he says, this one's mine. This one is mine. He's been purchased with a price. But old Isaac, he's got a problem. He's selfish. He goes down there and to summarize, because we're running out of time, he basically says, I would rather her be abused than me to lose my life. I'm glad Jesus didn't feel that way about me. I'm glad he was willing to die for me. The men of the place should kill me for Rebecca. Because she's a knockout. What's that have to do with it? See, these were men, these were men who were girl watchers. These were men who waited in the city. They were in influential positions. And when a good looking woman came into the city, they basically said, Well, if she has a husband, he's got to go. And if she doesn't have a husband, then she's fair game. I was standing in the vestibule of a church one time, not this church. And I was with a man who I love dearly. And we were having a great spiritual conversation. In the middle of that conversation, a young girl walked in, probably in her early 20s, with a little short dress on. 
And that man was looking at me. He did this. He was in another world. He was lost. There was no more conversation. He wasn't thinking about our conversation. I had lost him and I knew right then. He's got a problem. She's an object. He never even finished the conversation. Broke my heart. I love him. I pray for him. But that's the kind of man this was. And Isaac just says, it's not worth it. I'm too afraid. Fear has drawn in. And when I become fearful, I don't stand on the promises of God. And I therefore lie. And lie has a wage. And it came to pass when he had been there a long time. He'd been living his life a long time. You just think of the risk. You would think of the, 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 what Rebecca had to listen to. What she had to endure. Isaac, this promised miraculous son in which thy seed will fill the earth. It's a long time. And Abimelech, can't say the word today, king of the Philistines, looked out a window. Thank God he was standing there and looked out the window. Because Isaac didn't have enough sense to clean this up himself. So what's God got to do? He's got to take a pagan king who doesn't even know God is in a relationship and rebuke the child of God. You ever been there? You ever had a pagan? You ever had a lost person in your life in the workplace, wherever, and call you out on your sin? You talk about embarrassing. Boy, that is a double whammy. But this, this king is fearful of God when Isaac is not. The child of God has lost his reverence. He's no longer fearing his God. He thinks he can just live any old way, anywhere he wants to live it, because he's got the promise, he's got the covenant. Daddy Abraham's going to take care of him. Nana prayed for him. He's in. He's good. He can live any way he wants to live. And God just takes this secret sin, this lie, and he reveals it to this king. And he looked out the window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, his wife, and Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, of a surety, she is thy wife. And how saidest thou, she is my sister? And Isaac said unto him, Because I said, lest I die for her. What is this thou done to us? Just like Father Abraham. Be careful, Abraham, where you walk, because your babies might follow but how shameful it is that the child of God who's been chosen has to be rebuked and corrected by a heathen. Even the heathen know better. Verse 10. And Abimelech said, What is this thou have done unto us? One of the people might lightly have lain with thy wife, and thou shouldest have brought guiltlessness upon us. And Abimelech charged all his people, saying, He that toucheth this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. That is God's word. God said, You don't touch him. He spoke through this pagan king, this heathen. And Isaac sowed in the land and received in the same year a hundredfold. What? What? And the Lord blessed him. You talk about grace. You talk about amazing grace. You talk about being able to stand on a promise that Isaac in his first heir headed toward Egypt. In his second heir said, I'm going to lie and deceive because I'm fearful of man. I'm going to dishonor my God. I'm not going to pay reverence. I'm not going to fear God. Let that be for the heathen's problem. He gets called in the trap. And then God does not take him out and crush him. He blesses him hundredfold. Amen. I ran out of time and I got a long way to go. I tell you what. Just to make it real. One of my greatest fears as a young man and as an older one was to break my daddy's heart. But I'm going to tell you what would have hurt me a whole lot more than my daddy's belt. 
would have been for me to drag his good name and his good reputation through the mud and have him bless me. That's what Jesus has done for all of us. Because we were a whole lot worse off than Isaac. We were right there with the pagans, lost. And God in His goodness said, you followed in the same stumbling footsteps of Father Abraham. But because I made a covenant with Abraham, Abraham didn't make a covenant with God. God made a covenant with Abraham. Men break covenants. God does not. And He makes a promise. And not only that, He takes all of those promises and rolls them up until I bless thee. And He gives it all to Isaac despite who Isaac was, not because who Isaac was. And He says, you can either walk in the providential steps, the promises that I've given you, and I'm going to make those clear in my path, or you can continue to stumble in the path of your father, but my covenant and my blessing cannot be taken away. As you stand and Brother Don leads us, I'm going to ask you to let the Holy Spirit search your heart. If He is speaking to you about salvation, coming to Christ, asking Him to forgive you, to come into your heart and save you. If, you're asking, if He's asking you to join this church, to be baptized, to rededicate your life, to get on this blood-purchased altar, and pray to Him. I'm here as you need me, but I'm not necessary. You will meet the face of a living God. And He'll love you all the way down that aisle. And He'll carry you if you'll just take the first step. Will you obey? Will you walk in the steps He commands? Or will you walk in your own way? God bless you.